I have 1.30, so we're going to begin. So welcome to our virtual education program today. My name is Sandra Hubbard LeBlanc, and I'm the, rec uh, the not recreation coordinator. <laughs> I've never been a recreation coordinator. <laughs> coordinator. <laughs> I'm the regional coordinator for the Tri-County area for Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia, and I'm pleased to be your moderator today. We're excited to be able to connect and learn with you, and we are using Zoom for Healthcare, the online technology that helps us connect with you securely. If you are experiencing any troubles, please do send a message in the chat box to our ASNS host, Riley, and she will try her very best to help you through that. Uh, for today's session, all participants, <clears throat> pardon me, have been muted and their video is turned off. If by chance your video is on, we ask that you please do shut it off because we are recording the session and that just helps keep your confidentiality at the utmost uh, and your privacy at the utmost uh, of importance. With these privacy measures in place, we will be recording the session for future use. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, as we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on sacred land that has been the site of human activity since time immemorial. We are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation, the past, present and future caretakers of this land. I want to also recognize and offer gratitude to African Nova Scotians and their ancestors whose histories, legacies, and contributions in 50 communities for over 400 years have enhanced the part of Mi'kma'ki coloni colonially referred to as Nova Scotia. Here at, at the Alzheimer Society of Nova Scotia, we are working towards becoming a more diverse and inclusive organization where all Nova Scotians feel a sense of belonging. We use the acronym IDEA, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity and Accessibility, to apply a person-centered lens to our work and ensure we are fostering a sense of belonging in all that we do. To facilitate this work, we are grateful to be collaborating with the organize, organizations indicated on this slide, the Health Association of African Canadians, Le Réseau Santé de la Nouvelle-Écosse, ISANS, the Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia, and we collaborate with Mi'kmaq communities through various community leaders. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Our audience today includes people living with dementia, people caring for someone with dementia, and people who want to learn more. So a heartfelt welcome to you all. We'll have a 40 minute presentation followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers. Please do feel free to ask your questions using the private confidential chat box addressed to the ASNS host, Riley. Remember to press enter to send the message to us or we won't receive that question. Questions will only be seen by our host and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. Today's presentation, and I'm so happy that we're having this, is entitled Dementia and End of Life Care. Certainly a very important topic that we hope will bring you helpful knowledge as well as a few tools to help guide you through a challenging but also a very sacred time in a person's life. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce Bertha Brannan. Bertha is a retired registered nurse who is well known in the Tri-Counties and indeed in the province of Nova Scotia. During her 47 year career, which I can't believe because she's only 60, she has worked in acute care as administrator of a long term care facility and as a certified grief recovery specialist. Her passion for educating people along the grieving process began many years ago and continues to this day. She volunteers countless hours of her time meeting with people traveling the journey of loss. Bertha is the author of three books, the most recent published in March 2023, entitled A Pathway Through Loss, Revised Edition. And I'm always pleased to sh say she's a very dear friend of mine. So welcome, Bertha. Thank you very much, Sandra. You're welcome. Take it away. So 
First, I'd like to thank you for chiming in today because this is not an easy topic. And so it's, uh, I'd like to remind you that it's being recorded. And if you find that it's just too much emotionally for you to listen to, then feel comfortable stepping away and being able to catch it later on because it is, I realize, a difficult topic. What I hope to do in 40 minutes is to uh, assist caregivers uh, in providing emotional support to people who are dying, but also emotional support to the family, because obviously end of life is more than just the patient or the, or the client. So it provides some education and also specifically to look at how we can take care of ourselves as we do this. Sandra's going to move the slides along. So first of all, we need to look at what is grief. In our society, there's still a lot of people that feel that, that grief may be an unnatural response, but there's more and more research and literature and examples of people who realize that in life, there are going to be joys and there are going to be sorrows. So it's about understanding that grief is normal and it's natural. It's not just related to death. Some of you who are dealing with dementia already understand that there's many, many multiple losses that come along the journey of dementia. But we're also talking about loss of a home, loss of self-esteem, loss of many different losses that we'll touch on a little bit later on. It does create conflicting uh, feelings because as our body kind of adapts to the download of chemicals that come with loss, we do find ourselves sometimes floundering. We don't know which way is up and we don't know if what we're feeling is actually normal. It's important to realize that grief is an action of the heart. It is not an action of the brain. What I mean by that is, it cannot be logically put away. It's something that has to be felt and something that has to be experienced. Our Western society uh, focuses mostly on living rather than on dying. And we do know that we talk about all kinds of things in this day and age, but we rarely talk about loss and grief. We try to focus on moving forward rather than focusing on some of the things that we really need to pay attention to. So today I'm hoping that I'm going to help you to become aware of your own grief because it's something that we all experience. There are myths and sometimes I like to call them lies because that's a bit more appropriate that in our culture we have learned from a very young age and this has started from the time that we were a toddler to when we cry that uh, people would just say to us, well, don't cry, don't feel bad. You know, we'll fix that. We'll, we'll just distract you and uh, you'll feel better. And most of us know that a distraction only lasts temporarily. It doesn't make us feel better in the long term. Grieve alone is another myth that we have learned. Uh, nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to hear that. I know when I was growing up, it wasn't uncommon for people to say to me, my parents or even loved ones, if you want to cry, go to your room. Like nobody wants to see that. It's also about our society who emphasizes that by saying things like smile and the whole world smiles with you, cry and you cry alone. So we get these ideas early on in life that we need to shove these emotions down. Be strong is another learned myth. I don't doubt that all of you who are on here today are strong people. You're educating yourself. You're surviving life. Being strong is just not appropriate when we are grieving. That's the point I'm trying to make. That being strong is well in a lot of life issues. But when we are grieving, that's the time that we need support. It's the time that we need help. And we'll talk about some of the things that we can do to help ourselves along the way. Another myth is keep busy. Uh, I have over the 23 years that I've been doing the more recent, uh, more intense grief groups, a lot of people who have said things like, I keep myself busy during the day so that when I go to bed at night, I just crash. I am so exhausted that I don't have to think about 
all those sad feelings that I'm feeling. So keeping busy can be a myth. And I do want to point out as well here that what I'm saying is not to say that there's not times that you will have to grab an opportunity to distract yourself when you're grieving. What I'm saying is if every time you feel the emotional waves of grief, which are natural, that you shove those down and try to keep yourself busy by not thinking about it. So that's the point I'm trying to make. Replace the loss is a very common uh, peace offering, let's say, or advice from some people that will say, you know, what you should do is you should get a cat or you should get a dog. Or in the case of loss associated with divorce, sometimes people will be told things like, you'll find somebody better. You just need to get out there and find somebody else. So replacing the loss while we're grieving is another way, again, of shoving our emotions down, which I'll tell you in a bit why that's not a good thing. Time heals. When I was doing my training with the Grief Recovery Institute of California, this was one of the high points of every morning. The instructor, the man who, John James, who invented uh, the Grief Recovery Institute, would really emphasize that time alone does not heal. Yes, time does soften the journey and the emotions, but only when we choose to do some of the things, the small steps that we need to take in order to process this loss. The reality of grief and loss, and I think with the mental health focus that we're now seeing, thankfully, uh, there is more of, a, of a attention being given to the fact that in life, there will be losses and it does have an effect on our mental health. So when I hear people saying, if bad things happen, uh, sometimes, you know, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't say, it's not if bad things happen, it's when bad things happen. None of us are going to go through life and be as old as I am and not have some things that are very difficult to process. So in this life, there will be some sad things. Some of you that are associated with traveling through a journey of dementia know that all too well. The quality of life that we're trying to talk about during these periods of grief is we're trying to show how there can be some small actions that will help us manage the suffering that will help us through the process. But also what we want to do is to, uh, you know, focus on the reality that feeling emotional, feeling the heaviness and the burden of grief and the suffering of grief is not a sign of weakness. Grief is a normal, natural feeling. It is natural. It does have a process. What I mean by it's non-negotiable is based on what I've heard from a lot of people over the years, but also a lot of the research that talks about if you choose to shove it down or to not acknowledge it or to go with, I'm not going to cry, I am strong, I can deal with this, don't talk to me about it, that eventually all of the chemicals that come on board with grief will have to go someplace. And we keep those on board in our body, in our physical, emotional, and spiritual self. And so when we say it's not negotiable, what we really mean is you have to go through the process now or later. And what we're hoping is that it won't be a longer process than grief naturally uh, brings on, that by hopefully focusing on it at the time that we're feeling the loss means that we can move forward rather than carry this for years and then have it erupt later on in other mental illness, in stress, or physical illness. So you process it now or later is something that you will find if you research any uh, data or any material on grief and loss. There is a stress hormone called cortisol, which is a good hormone. That's what all of us have on board, and it helps us make healthy decisions about our future and about different changes that we might want in our life. 
But it is known that when we're suffering a huge loss, and again, a loss is associated not just with the death of a person, but multiple losses that we will have throughout life, that our body will produce more cortisol and more of the hormones that we have in our system that do affect the way that we feel and the way that we are. The first thing is that it affects the way we're thinking. And for some of you, if you have had losses, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That those first few days of trying to process the bad news or the sad news, your brain is not thinking the same as before. Some people have said things like, I'm just fuzzy. Some people, a lot of people will come back and will say, even months later, they'll say, I'm just not myself. So we know that a lot of that is based on the overabundance of cortisol that our brain is carrying. So it's not just about switching our emotions. It's about acknowledging that there is a chemical response in the body. The second thing we know high cortisol affects is our digestion. For some people, they can't eat. For some people, they can't stop eating. The reason that I have for years talked about grief is because I am convinced that if we don't talk about it, we keep it on board, and that eventually, maybe not next week, maybe not next year, but eventually, we will weaken our immune system. And we all know that our immune system is what keeps us healthy. So I have a few favorite thanatologists because I do always research uh, the, the uh, topic of grief because obviously it interests me. Uh, Douglas Smith is a thanatologist that I was more than fortunate to attend some of his sessions as he traveled to Halifax, Nova Scotia a few years ago, quite a few years ago actually. But I really liked what he talked about and it, it, he resonated with me. Uh, a lot of thanatologists have in, influenced uh, what I believe about grief, but he his three points really resonated with me that if we're trying to help people, especially when we know that healing is not possible. Some of you that are dealing with Alzheimer's already know that. But when we're talking about end of life, whether it's a person with dementia or a person suffering from some other fatal disease, we know that we can offer some healing when we can't offer curing. And what Douglas Smith talks about is we have to be authentic. In other words, we have to be real. We have to be honest. We have to bring our humanity to the person, not by having some advice or by having some cliches about it's going to get better or don't think that, but by being real. And a lot of what being real means to some people and say, well, I really don't understand how to be real when I'm that distracted or that upset. It's simply by acknowledging that you don't know what the person is going through. You can't imagine it, but you're here. You're here to listen. You're here to try to understand. Having a positive regard also means not judging the person. And this is especially when somebody is, uh, and I'm thinking of a, a very recent case, somebody is dying of a COPD or lung disease. And that person has been a smoker all their life. We don't know why they smoked. We don't know what smoking gave them in terms of helping them medicate their pain. But what we do know is that we have to put that aside and we can't judge by saying, well, or even thinking, if you weren't a smoker, you may not have ended up in this condition. And you know, this one has a personal uh, story attached to me as I had a husband who died of uh, very serious uh, heart disease and he was a smoker. And in those days, there were some healthcare professionals that would just point that out. You know, if you hadn't smoked, you wouldn't be here. Not helpful. That is not helpful. Empathy is different than sympathy, is that you're not 
crying with the person, but you're showing that you understand. And what Douglas Smith talks about is these three things are great points, but in order to provide some support to somebody, you have to be able to show all three. So when we're talking about total suffering, there's different kinds of suffering. So we're talking about physical suffering. We're talking about spiritual suffering. The existential suffering is, you know, predominant in Nova Scotia at the time when we think of, you know, the fires that have caused so much uh, harm, so much sadness to so many people. And even those of us who are not affected uh, certainly feel uh, the effects of having something that uh, sad and that tragic happen to our province. It's also a good time to mention that at this time in our lives, it is important to realize that if you're feeling off your game, even before these fires, that COVID has for a lot of people created a grief response. And sometimes we may not be aware that we're feeling a little bit different and we can't pinpoint it, but certainly the restrictions that COVID uh, put on our culture and also the disagreements that came with it between families, between people over the vaccine and all of that kind of stuff did have an effect on our response. port a was another one that even though we weren't maybe uh, directly affected as a whole province, we did have a response to such sad news. So when we're living in days of uh, financial difficulties in days of different uh, weather events, in days of sadness. It's for us to acknowledge that if we're feeling a little sad right now, we're feeling a little off, it's because we are receiving a lot of these events. So cultural uh, total suffering when we're talking about Aboriginal and all of the events that we have been made aware of right now, all of the uh, you know, the atrocities that have happened in our, in our country. And so we have to recognize and realize that all of these realizations do affect how we are going to process our happy life. So psychological, of course, and then of course, there's other symptoms that we will go into a little bit later. So I do think it's worthwhile to talk about the stages of death and dying. Because in the 1960s, when Elizabeth Kubler-Ross decided that she was going to uh, print her knowledge about the grief process, those of us that were in the healthcare profession grabbed onto this information because we hadn't had much information beforehand. And so, when we looked at the five stages that were identified by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, we tended to apply those to people who were grieving. I was fortunate enough, again, in my training with John James, uh, to learn that he had talked with and even co-wrote a book with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, that her intention was not to apply these stages to people who were grieving, but in fact, to apply these stages to people who had been diagnosed and were facing a fatal terminal illness. And so it's important for us to not try to put people who are grieving into these stages, because my experience has been that people will come back and say, well, I don't think I'm processing this loss normally because I've never felt anger. And I don't think that I'm doing it right because I haven't, you know, I never had this bargaining. I never promised that I would exchange this for a healing or whatever. So in other words, what we're doing by imposing these stages is suggesting to people that there is a pattern to loss. The point I want to make here is everybody's journey through loss is different. It doesn't mean that you fit in a pigeonhole of, you know, I'm going through shock and then I'm going to go through denial and you get what I'm saying. It's about making people aware that grief 
is directly related to the amount of love that you have for the person or the place or the thing that you have lost. And so it's making sure that we realize that everybody's journey is different. And although there is uh, a process and there are some commonalities to the grief journey, uh, it is important to realize that we should not just inform people who are grieving that they will uh, process these through, this, through these stages. It can cause harmful expectations as I have many examples of people coming back thinking that they're not doing it right. There is no right way to grieve. That's the only rule about grief. There's no rule. So there are healers. There's good news as we travel through this very difficult, normal life event of loss. We do know there's three tools that will help. They're not big tools, but they're important tools. We know that we need to express these feelings. I had a lady in group, a lot of people that I get close to because people who are grieving are honest. And one of the examples that she used was, I feel like my stomach is full of toonies and it's really, really heavy. When I talk or when I cry, I feel a little lighter, like some of these toonies are coming out. That was an analogy that worked for her and I thought it was appropriate. You know, it, it kind of described how it is. So we need to express those feelings. We need to protest. What I mean by that is, in huge losses, we need to wish it undone. And sometimes that means we need to scream it undone. We need to let those emotions out. How, how could this happen to me? How am I going to get through it? So it's about the reality that we need to understand that these emotions have to be expressed. Now, some of you will say, well, what if I don't want to talk? And a lot of people don't. Uh, not to pick on men, but uh, historically, men have been trained even more so than the female to be strong, to keep their feelings inside, and to not cry. And wrongfully thought that crying was a sign of weakness, when in fact, Males and females both have tear ducts. So it's about understanding that three things will help us. Talking, crying, and if you're not a crier, it is about journaling. Because we do know that by journaling, it is one way to process a lot of these feelings that we have inside. We do know that a loss will resurrect old losses. And I hear this over and over again in grief group. I haven't thought about those sad things for a long, long time. Why is it that they're coming back now? And that is a normal process of grief. So what we're hoping is that you will realize that talking and not talking to people who tell you how to fix it, talking to people who let you talk and say whatever it is that you need to express. Remember, your brain is not the same. You might say things that you would never say otherwise, but these things need to be expressed. I will also say that in the last year or so, uh, the Recovery Institute has even instituted a program that will help people cry. And that is because they realize that crying is very therapeutic. We do know that tears of grievers under a microscope carry toxic chemicals. Tears of people who have won the lottery carry happy hormones that we have on board. So it's about talking, crying, journaling, and doing more of what you know makes you feel better. What not to say applies to the person who is grieving and applies to the caregiver who is helping somebody. I know how you feel. No, you don't. If I've lost my husband and you've lost yours, I don't know how you feel. I might have an idea of how you feel, but the grief journey is based on the love of the relationship. It can also be exaggerated by guilt. 
if there is a guilt associated with the loss, whether it's a legitimate guilt because we intended harm or an illegitimate guilt when it's just our brain telling us stuff that's really not true, just alarming us. So I know how you feel is not helpful. You can't fall apart is not helpful. Keep a stiff upper lip. These are all things that don't acknowledge what the person is going through. And I've talked to many grievers over the years. And what they will all say is that nobody expects a listener to fix you, but they expect a listener to acknowledge you. And so it's about uh, not making the person feel bad for feeling bad. Be thankful you're not left alone is another thing that doesn't help. Or they're in a better place. Or God wanted a child. All of these things are just not appropriate because they don't acknowledge what the person is going through. Uh, I did have, uh, uh, that's okay. I did have at one point a pastor share that he knew his mom had died. He knew that she was in heaven. He felt it in his heart that she was in heaven. But when people would say to him, you know, you're lucky because you know your mom's with Jesus, he said, I know that, but I want her here. So it doesn't help for you to say that to me. So, so it is about as a caregiver, what do you bring to the patient and to your family? It's important to stop and think about what our values and beliefs are but also not to impose them on the family that you're trying to support. Or even within your own family, people have different beliefs and different values. And so it's about becoming aware of where other people are coming from rather than coming out and saying things like, well, they're in a better place or <clears throat> this is what you need to do. So it's about sitting down sometimes and just really thinking about what am I bringing to the table? Am I bringing all of my expertise, which may not be what the person wants to hear or doesn't resonate with the person? It's also about what are your myths about loss and grief? Do you think that you have to just, to use the most recent term, suck it up and just move forward and you know, just forget about all of these emotions and in time you'll feel better because these, these are some of your myths, then you're not going to be helping the person. So it's about acknowledging the emotional components of pain. And what I mean by that is we all know that there are some things that will take our mind off of our pain temporarily. Does it mean our pain's not real? No. It just means that there are some things that can be done to sometimes shut down that left brain that is alarming and chatting all the time by engaging our creative brain in some things that will bring a little bit of difference or relief to that emotional pain that we're feeling. Uh, the last gift of love that we can give to a person that we love who is dying is to be present for them. Difficult journey, but to be present for them. I would suggest, and uh, not that you do this right now, but this is an exercise that I have found very useful for myself, but also very useful for people who have been uh, on their grief journey, is to write, and this can take a whole wall rather than a piece of paper, okay? But to create your own loss graph by looking at the time that you first had that initial uh, memory of a painful event can be the age of three, four, or five, that first loss that you identified. And going to the present future and writing down all of the losses that you have had up to that time. It's also a time of... Uh, how you made decisions and uh, whether or not you kind of minimize those losses based on what people have said. For example, if you were very young and your dog died and you felt really sad and your mother said, that's okay, we'll get a new dog. Whether you believe that that would alleviate your pain or your grief, but in the long run, you know, it didn't, not the same dog, not the same relationship. 
So it is an exercise in memory, but it's also about looking at how you manage and whether or not your personality allowed you to understand what you were going through and what you were, what your understanding was of what created that grief. And, and the reason I talk about that is it has been my experience to hear many, many times people talking about when they're doing their grief uh, graph is that they're thinking that they're just presenting the recent loss that they've had. But then when they're writing all the losses, they're realizing that the way they process or didn't process those other losses have a huge, huge impact on where they are now. The other thing is that they may not realize, sometimes people say, when I was doing that, oh my goodness, I had an aha moment. I remember this sad, sad thing, but I didn't realize that that was a grief process for me. I didn't realize that that had an effect on my life. And that can be losses that we just don't acknowledge at the time, but they're still significant. And we don't acknowledge them because people have said to us, well, never mind, just move on. You'll get a better job. One of the examples I use here is in puppy love. That first rejection of breaking up with somebody that you fall in love the first time. A lot of us will say, well, never mind. You'll find somebody else, somebody better. You know, there's all kinds of fish in the sea. Not acknowledging that's a huge, huge loss for young people. So how do we have those difficult conversations? It is much easier, I'll admit it, and we all know it, to just change the subject or to just, you know, distract ourselves, turn on the music and talk about something else. But how do we have those difficult conversations when somebody is sharing with us? And I'll say this, it's a privilege when people choose to share with us. So when people want to share with us their innermost, innermost issues, their feelings, their, those emotions that exaggerate their pain or exacerbate their pain is what I'm talking about. So difficult conversations, tell me more. As an example, somebody is dying and they're saying to you, my daughter can't wait for me to die because all she's waiting for is my uh, inheritance. It's a difficult conversation to have. We could say things like, oh, I'm sure she's not. That doesn't acknowledge what the person is saying. So tell me about your daughter. Means that you are hearing what she's saying and you are listening and that you're allowing her the time to talk about it, to unload it, because our emotions have to be shared. They have to be undone by allowing people to allow us to share them. Another thing is what I hear you saying is this. Sometimes it can be redirecting a person. If somebody is really, really upset, and sometimes that can happen often uh, when people just can't, uh, they get overwhelmed or, you know, because there's been some incident that has exacerbated their journey. Somebody has visited and said something that's really upsetting. Sometimes a staff maybe hasn't intended to be upsetting, but it is. So sometimes we use redirection, especially with people with dementia, because we do know that people with dementia will repeat, repeat, repeat. This has worked many times. I had quite a few years in the nursing home and realized that when people were saying, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home, that what they really wanted to do was talk about home. You know, sometimes it's, let's go home and you tell me what we're going to find. You tell me what, who's there. You tell me. So redirecting to a pleasant thought but also allowing the person to share more. What are we going to do once we get there? What was the best thing, the best time in your life? What helped you the most? Anyway, you kind of get it. Again, I'm repeating, dementia is not a disease of the brain. It's, this is, a, this is a, an error here. It's not a disease of the heart. Take that off. It is a disease of the heart. And what I mean by that is, even though the person has lost all cognition, and they really have lost orientation and all that kind of stuff, and maybe have even lost their knowledge of who you are. Their emotions are the same. Their emotions stay there. So we wanna look at palliative care, and I will 
share with you that I did uh, borrow a lot of this stuff from Baycrest, uh, which is a, an amazing care center in Toronto that looks and does an amazing job with palliative care. So I did look at some of their material, was uh, fortunate enough to, to attend a, a conference there. And so some of what I'm sharing is part of what I learned there. I also will share that a lot of what I learned too is by working as a registered nurse and as a long-term care administrator in spending a lot of time at the bedside of people who were dying. So when we're talking about looking at illness, we're talking about several things. We're talking about how well people can get around. You know, are they really at ambulating well? In other words, they can get around on their own. They can sit up by themselves. Are they lying down a lot? Are they bedridden? Do they need assistance to get up and to move? So their activity and evidence of illness goes from being normal to absolutely none. So this kind of gives us a perspective, let's say, of what we're going to be facing when we're looking at the journey, but also when we're entering the, for the first time, uh, taking care of trying to offer care to somebody who is at end of life. So self-care, are they able to look after themselves or do they need assistance or is it total care? So you get this slide, which is, you know, looking at the whole picture of ambulation, activity, self-care, intake, and their level of consciousness. And then from those lens, looking at what are some of the realistic goals that we can offer these people. When we look at, I found this interesting, that when we look at somebody suffering uh, approaching end of life through cancer, that the research will tell you that people who are dying of cancer basically generally of course not everybody but the majority will remain fairly stable to a 50 percent decline which happens in the last three months so for people with heart disease that that lead to thought to death it's a steady decline with some periods of health that come and go with dementia i mean look at dementia compared to these, it's an ongoing journey, a roller coaster of decline that can last for years, for some up to 10 years. So it's, it's a different uh, situation that you're facing. What we wanna do is we want to improve their quality of life. We wanna provide comfort when we know there's no cure. So again, I think I've made this clear in what I've talked about so far, that people who are grieving, whether it's the person dying or the person that is carrying that grief because of a family member, obviously uh, dying, they don't want to be fixed. They know it can't be fixed, but they do want to be heard. Very, very, very important to talk to family members at their level of understanding, not to come in with a medical jargon or, you know, even the abbreviations, the acronyms that we use to respect the person and the family enough to sit down and talk to them at their level and to make sure that they understand what you're talking about and what the physician who has just come in and rattled off some medical terms and has now left, or like some maybe has taken the time to sit, but most of them are busy. They come in, tell you what's going on and then leave. So your role is to make sure that people have a clear understanding of what that means and what it doesn't mean. Because sometimes an alarm can be raised by misunderstanding what somebody is saying. So again, it's about looking at the decline towards death. It's looking at the normal process of what, what occurs from the time the person's physical systems shut down to the eventual death. Having a, a pamphlet on the dying process has been invaluable to helping families understand, to have the time to absorb what information is in there and to have the time to come back and ask relevant and pertinent questions. So it is about what are some of the goals? Do we want to keep this person at home? Do they need more preparation for what's really gonna happen? 
Do they want their spiritual needs addressed? Not to impose your spiritual needs on them, but what are their spiritual needs? And I was fortunate a few years ago to have a book that I now lost that was written by hospice nurses who had a total of over 100 years of experience in hospice. And what they were talking about was that there was a process that people who knew they were dying or people who were facing death had to do three things in order to kind of reach that acceptance. And that was to ask forgiveness, to say, I love you, and to say their goodbyes before they reach that final stage of turning inwards and connecting with what their perception of the next journey was. So is it to strengthen family relationships? And is it to look at the goals of the caregivers as well as the family, as well as the patient, I mean? Pain. I did touch on, there are some few little things that we can help to alleviate pain, but we know that for a lot of people, pain will be an issue. So we're looking at when pain is mild to moderate, that one of the drugs of use that is most helpful is codeine. Also, we know that codeine also can cause constipation. Morphine and hydromorphone are some of the drugs. When we're moving into more severe pain, hopefully that can be managed. We're looking at, again, morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl, and methadone. It's important for families to understand, because I've heard this, that some people feel that fentanyl and methadone are street drugs and that they might cause the person to overdose, when in fact, these are very well-researched drugs that are helpful when we're managing uh, severe pain. There's also uh, the other drugs that you, that the NSAIDs, the acetaminophen, the steroids, and the anticonvulsants that depending on the person's condition might be things that are prescribed by the palliative care team or that are some other drugs that you might even ask if that's something that might be helpful. Nausea. Nausea is another one. It's to identify the cause of nausea. And at first to look at not just giving grab all, but to identify what is causing the nausea. Again, constipation can be from the codeine. Sometimes it can be from the side effects of drugs. Sometimes it can be because they ate something that upset them, the same as might happen when we're not dying, right? And sometimes it can be the dizziness caused by moving, uh, Certainly repositioning somebody uh, who's dying is, is very, very difficult. Sometimes we'll bring on that vertigo. And sometimes it can be from intracranial pressure, depending if the cancer or if the changes in the brain have uh, brought on different pressure. And some of the meds that are good for nausea, as you know, are Gravol, Haldol, and Domperidone. Shortness of breath. We see that in a lot of patients who are dying. Again, it's about looking at some of the drugs, the non-drug things that might help by repositioning a person to sit up a little bit more, having a fan, relaxation exercises, of course, oxygen. And there are some drugs that can help the normal fluid that accumulates in lungs at the end of life. Cahexia is, again, to revisit the goals. And for some people, when the families think and, you know, we know with end of life, sometimes there is such a huge loss of muscle uh, that we feel that it's because the person's not being, having enough nutrition. But it's to understand that this is a part of what happens oftentimes at the end of life, that there's no longer uh, muscle uh, stability, so to speak, that naturally as the body shuts down, the muscles will shrink and the body will change to that look that we uh, feel that can be reversed, but it can't. So loss of fat, loss of muscle are some of the things that we will see. The reason I mentioned eating is because it has been my experience that a lot of people will feel that if you stop feeding people, they're going to die. When in fact, when people are dying, they stop being hungry. And so we could talk a lot more than that, but we don't have a lot of time. So loss of appetite can be some of the things that, that, of course, we need to look at as well. Is it because they have a dry mouth? Uh, they can't difficulty swallowing. Some of the foods just turns you off. Side effect of meds, fatigue, just sometimes exhaustion. So some of the other things that we look out for or the palliative care team hopefully will look out for is whether they're anemic, 
dehydrated, haven't slept. Uh, and again, with the dementia, they just don't know because of the cognitive impairment or infection, urine infection being a very common one that can cause a lot of issues. At the end of life, 85% of people will enter a state of delirium, which is different than dementia and that their symptoms are basically the same, but we know that it's an irreversible. But at the same time, it's not to just say, okay, this is where they're at. And now they're getting more confused. It's about, again, assessing for different physiological things that could, that could influence that. So non-pharmacology approaches. I'm not going to read this because I know we're running out of time. But I think you know, uh, you can read it for yourself or you can go back and review it. But a lot of it is about paying attention to what makes the room and the person comfortable. It's also about removing some of the blood pressure checks and all of that stuff that can be invasive and can be just more for your comfort than the person who's dying. I think uh, we'll probably skip over this. Uh, we'll keep the, keep the slide for, you, for your reference later on. It's recognizing that your energy is not automatically refilled. So if you are gonna be a caregiver, you need to take care of yourself. You need to take care of yourself, number one. When I do sessions on how many people like to help people, all the hands go up. When I do sessions on how many people like to receive help, all the hands go down. So it's about recognizing that if you're going to be an effective caregiver, you need help. You need support. You need to understand that your grief is affecting how you're going to be feeling and able to carry this. And again, with dementia, long journey of end of life. Uh, I'm going to get you to read this again on your own because of time. So what we're hoping about, what we're hoping rather, and I will go back to that when it says turn your phone off. Uh, that last slide, I did catch a glimpse of that, turn your phone off whenever possible. This is a pet peeve of mine, I guess, too, that when you're caring for somebody, don't be on your phone. I don't care how old you are. Don't be on your phone. Be there present for the person. You might be bored out of your mind but don't have your phone on. Uh, last hours, it's to cure sometimes. And sometimes we can make people feel better by music or comedy or telling them a story or doing something for them, like writing a letter. It's to relieve often, but to comfort always. And comfort means being present. Thank you for your attention. Sandra, I tried to code it, keep it in within 40 minutes. So now we'll answer some of the questions. Thank you very, very much, Bertha. That was so informative. And I took a few notes as you were speaking. And, you know, I really enjoyed the way you said it's important, you know, that we, we need to work with the losses, not against them, and to be real in that process. And it is so true, um, you know, which also means facing the end of life for yeah. the person with dementia or whoever we're caring for, which isn't easy. But sometimes the facing it then opens up the doorway to us being more open and to seeing the needs of our person who is dying and then to find the solutions and to reach out for that help. So to exactly. get the tools yeah. and the processes. So, yeah. it, you know, it, it was so well said for sure. Um, I guess when I talk about uh, the last gift of love, I think I'm thinking sometimes because we're human, hmm. we're feeling you know, the grief, the stress of entering somebody's room who is dying, but it is our last gift of love to make this about them. Absolutely. Yeah. That is the best takeaway ever. We may throw in just one quick little question, um, which I'd really, you know, we are short on time, but I feel it's very important. Is there a difference between palliative care and regular medical care for a person who is dying? Yes. Uh, I, I wish that I could share with you that across the province of Nova Scotia, that it's equal. Uh, you know, they're, they're, if somebody is lucky or unlucky enough to enter hospice, certainly hospice has a whole different concept about what the end of life is. Uh, we are slow in this province in having hospice uh, palliative care. That means that the whole journey is is around the person who is dying and around the family, including pets, 
a lot of people, that's why we have a push to have people die at home. So it can be more natural. But we do know in reality, a lot of people die in hospital. And in hospital, although there are some palliative care teams, there's a lot of missing uh, resources in terms of the support staff are just not always there and available to be able to provide that. But when we're talking about palliative care, we're talking about basically a plan of care that involves the heavy drugs uh, that are necessary to manage pain, uh, confusion, uh, nausea, and those kinds of things. But we have a long ways to go, Sandra, you know, in terms of recognizing that this is a different, uh, it's it's not the same as recovering from surgery, so to speak. You know? Absolutely, so it's, yes. It's a whole thing different than what acute care is. Yes, and to not be afraid to reach out for help and speak to doctors and medical professionals you're working with, because it is a very sacred time. And the more help you can get to provide comfort to your loved one will also bring comfort to you. Um, Okay, well, Bertha, I wish we had a lot more time. We don't. Uh, Perhaps we'll bring you back for another event. You never know. But you will, for the people uh, in the room, you will see poll questions on your screen. Please do take a minute to respond to them. And uh, I do want to thank you so much, Bertha, for this very helpful, informative, emotional, beautiful uh, discussion that we tend to put off. And I, I'm so glad, you know, we welcome you with open arms to open up the discussion, which is so crucial uh, for this end of life and uh, loss and grief talk that you gave us today. It's thank you to, to pack in. It's a lot to pack in. There's is. a lot more things that we could talk about, obviously. You know, most of the sessions that I do are a minimum of two hours. So, yes, you know, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you did have questions that we weren't able to get to today, please do reach out to the info line that you're seeing on your screen. We do want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Please send your comments or suggestions for topics on the chat or to our office at the 1-800 number on your screen. If you would like to have a confidential call with one of our info line staff, please call the number on your screen as well, and we will be more than happy to reach out to you. This session was recorded and will be hosted on the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia YouTube channel so that you can watch it again or share it with family or use as a teaching tool. Thank you and remember to be gentle with yourselves. And uh, thank you so much for being here again, Bertha, and have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thank you, everybody.